is Go Beyond, the teaching and preaching ministry with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, please come and visit us. Let's now join in with the Judah Ministries praise team at the Worship Center. It's a new season and it's a new day a fresh anointing is flowing Prosperity
Amen. Well, praise God, it's been an exciting morning with the worship. God is just continuing to show up here, and the river just keeps overwhelming us. I think I used the analogy, it was the last week, you know, in Ezekiel, when he saw the river flowing out from underneath the temple. First it came out, it was just a little trickle, you know. Then it became ankle deep. Then it got up to his knees. <laughs> then it was up to his waist. Then it was over his head. Honey, I'm telling you, it's just coming and coming in floods. I want to encourage you just to jump in. Revival's not coming. Thank you. It's here. Amen. That's why, you know, people say, oh, we're waiting for a moving God, a move of God. No, we are a move of God. You know, people always looking off to the horizon. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. So we are continuing our study with Joseph. Our journey with Joseph this morning is part three. We are going to look at Genesis chapter 39, beginning right in verse 1. Genesis 39, uh, right at verse 1. Just a real quick review. In chapter 37, we saw that Joseph was the favored one of the father, and he wore the coat of many colors, and his brothers despised him. They were very jealous of him because he was God's favored. And we talked about sometimes when you're favored, people will be jealous of your favor. Even within your own family, somebody. Come on, somebody help me out this morning, right? So, you know, sometimes when God's favor is on us, there, it's going to stir up contention around the people that are closest to us. Now, the, on the other side of that corn, we must be careful that we don't become jealous of somebody else's favor, somebody else's blessing, somebody else's anointing, when somebody else receives something. You know, where's mine? You know, you need to drop that ugly attitude. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that with Joseph his, uh, in, in, in chapter 37, his brother's... Uh, we're going to kill him, but then they decided to throw him in a pit, and they eventually sold him into slavery uh, into Egypt. Then chapter 38, we're skipping chapter 38 because we want to stay with our theme of Joseph. Chapter 38, you know, if you like uh, soaps, you know, as the world turns, as Israel turns, <laughs> Read chapter 38 of the book of Genesis. It's about Judah, you know, the one brother whose his son had passed away and his wife Tamar was without a husband. So in that culture, the next youngest brother, the next brother in line, when he grew old enough, would marry her. Well, she didn't want to wait for that, so she went and posed herself as a harlot. I'm not making this up. <laughs> this is in your Bible, Exodus or uh, Genesis chapter 38. She poses herself as a harlot, covers herself up. When Judah comes along, her father-in-law sees her. He takes her as his harlot, and then, you know, she outs him. And so, anyhow, so you have Judah and Tamar, you know. But here's the thing. You know, when we see that whole mess, when he, we see that whole soap opera, we, we see the debauchery, the mess in this family lineage. Judah, who was with the harlot, right? Where did Jesus come from? Then we're talking about the line of the tribe of Judah. We're talking about Jesus Christ and his lineage. And if you track back from Jesus all the way back to Abraham, how many of you know there's a whole lot of mess? But yet God brought forth his Savior. He brought forth his Messiah. I don't care what your generation before you did. You need to turn around. See you later. I'm moving on. Forget about the past. Forget about your upbringing. Forget about your great-great-grandfather and whatever he did. It doesn't matter because Jesus, come on somebody, changes everything. You've been given a new life. You've been born again. All things are passed away. All things, somebody say all things, all things. have become new. So read Genesis chapter 38 with that in mind. Amen? Genesis chapter 39. Verse 1, the Bible says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt 
Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who have taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. I'm, I want to read that again. The Lord was with Joseph uh, so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of the, his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, keep that phrase in mind, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in the eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. What a wonderful life would that be, huh? What would I like uh, for lunch? Cheesecake or apple pie? Hmm. All right, finish verse 6. Now Joseph was a hunk of, hunk of burning love. Some call him eye candy. The Bible clear to say that he was well built, he was a stud, and he was handsome. And after a while, his master's wife was warm for his form. And she took notice of Joseph and said, let's hook up. Basically, that's the Yerusha translation, but y'all get the picture of what's happening here. Potiphar's wife was making a play for Joseph because he was hot. We're going to deal with that in another message, so come on back next week. So first off, in verse 3, the Bible says that his master saw that the Lord was with him. In other words, listen, church, a heathen, an unbelieving boss, witnessed God's favor on him. How many of you here might have a heathen boss? Mm. Here's the question, though. Does your unbelieving heathen boss recognize God's favor of Jesus Christ in your life? Does your company prosper because of you? Ah. How about our circle of relationships outside the church here? Do they see God's favor on us? Do they uh, hear God's favor coming from our mouth? Y'all getting quiet on me, but I'm just going to go ahead and speak anyhow. Because listen, God's fa if you have Jesus in you, if you have the Holy Spirit in your life, God's favor is on you, honey. We need to make it evident to the church. So d does the world see it in our lives? Do they hear it? Or do we sound and look too much like the Egyptians. We're called, we've been set apart. That's what the word holy means, set apart. Verse 2, the Lord says, or the Bible says that the Lord was uh, with Joseph in everything he did, and everything he did had prospered. So let's glean a couple of things from this passage. First off, listen to this, godly prosperity and location have nothing to do with each other. Godly prosperity and circumstances, come on church, have nothing to do with anything. God can't prosper you in any place that you are. He can prosper you in whatever circumstance you are in. It took Joseph having to go into captivity as a slave for somebody to recognize God's favor on him. I'm trying to help somebody here this morning. It was the world that seen God's favor on Joseph. He had to go outside his own family for somebody to witness his anointing. Mm. While he was yet home with his peeps, he was still sleeping to noon, playing video games. He was favored. He had dreams. He had vision. He was the one that wore a coat of many colors. When he got up at the crack of noon, he was sure to have his little latte and crumpets. Oh, come on. I'm talking about easy life. That's where Joseph was living. But it wasn't until there was a new season in his life 
there wasn't until it wasn't until there was a, a shift there it wasn't until there was a new environment listen church extremely inconvenienced in a foreign land that God began to prosper and use Joseph it wasn't until he was placed in an uncomfortable situation whereby he was not his own mm. Joseph became a slave now how many of you know that if we're born again we are not of our own any longer ah you ain't convincing me y'all if you're born again we are not of our own the Bible actually says that we become slaves to Jesus Christ all right watch this well pastor you need to show me that in the Bible all right here it is <laughs> Romans 6, chapter, I'm sorry, yeah, Romans 6, beginning with verse 20. When you were slaves to sin. Now, how many in here has been slaved to a joint? To a bottle? To a crack pipe? Oh, come on, you're a church. Come on, church. Tell the truth. Shame that devil. How many of you have been enslaved to a man in an unhealthy relationship or a, a woman in an unhealthy relationship? Come on, somebody. We were slaves to sin, Paul writes. You were free from the control of righteousness because we were slaves to sin. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Ah, here it is, verse 22. Come on, somebody shout, but now, but now that you've been set free from sin, you have become slaves of God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody in the house of Judah needs to give him a shout right there. My God! So we are no longer slaves to this world, but we've now become slaves unto Jesus Christ. We've become slaves unto righteousness. Now I want to run down a little rabbit trail here this morning while we're on this word slave, because the word slave has a very negative connotation in America. Amen? Amen? Rightfully so. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's just the weight that it carries. Uh, however, when we read the word in Scripture, the word slave, we must understand its first century cultural meaning. So I want to break this down for you. This is a little, a little side trail here. Remember, the Bible wasn't written to Americans. <laughs> the, the Bible is not American centric. It's, it's Jewish centric. Mostly, the Bible was written to first, it's a first century book written by and to mostly Middle Eastern people. So here's a little Bible study about slavery. Because there's a common question you hear sometimes does God approve slavery in the Bible? Because you see it from Genesis through revelation so you see so does god approve of slavery in the bible remember you must read everything in context because if you leave out some of the text you're eventually going to get stuck with a con watch this the kkk well i don't know if they was or is i don't even know if they exist any longer but they were or are considered a Christian organization. It's true. It's true. They believe that slavery is God approved. It's a con, it's a lie, and it's wicked. I'm trying to tell somebody this morning that everybody who claims Christianity is not. There are a lot of doctrines of demons out there in the name of Christ. 
here. Let me say this. Pro-abortion is a doctrine of a demon. I don't care if it comes from the pulpit or the White House. That's a doctrine of a devil. So everybody who claims Christianity, church, is not. There's a lot of doctrines of demons out there, and the devil knows how to take this word and twist it. He tried it with Jesus. What makes you think he won't try it with you? That's why we have to know this Bible for ourselves. So we need to define the word slave in the Bible because once again, in America, when we hear the word, we immediately uh, refer back to our history of slavery, which is very negative, very wicked. It's definitely a blight on our history. Amen? But somebody thank God we're not there any longer. Amen. So in the Bible, when we read the word, especially in the New Testament, as we read in Romans, the Greek word is doulos, which means servant. More accurately, doulos means bond servant. It means bond servant. Let me explain the difference. A slave is somebody who is uh, forced against their will to be a servant. Did you follow me there? Forced against their will. A bond servant, a doulos, is one who gives himself up wholly to another's will. In other words, he chooses to serve his master. That is a doulos. Did you get the difference is the will? Whose will is it? If it's the master's will causing you, forcing you, that's slavery. If it's a doulos, if it's a bond servant, I choose to serve you. Do you know the word doulos in the New Testament, which is interpreted in some translations in your Bible, says slave, that was the highest compliment that you could give any Christian. Just telling you what the word says. The highest compliment isn't bishop. (laughs) The highest compliment isn't pastor. The highest compliment that you could pay anybody in the Bible is to call them a doulos, a bond servant, one who chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. I'm trying to help you here this morning. One who's willing to say, Lord, I will. No matter what you call me to, I will. Here am I, Lord. Send me a doulos. Whatever, whenever, wherever, I'll go, Lord. That's a doulos. What would you say, Lord? Sweep the floors? I'll do it. Oh, come on, church. That's a doulos, a bond servant. Now, sometimes in our culture, we kind of use that word uh, interchangeably with a like a contractor or a subcontractor. For an example, when we hear an athlete, he signs a contract to play for a professional sports team. He's contracted. He is a doulos to that team. Are you all with me? So when we come to Jesus Christ. We give up our rights. Oh, come on, somebody. We give up our will because we're now submitted to the will of Jesus Christ. If you're with me, come on, somebody shout amen. So uh, slavery in, uh, in America history was wicked and evil just like it was when the Egyptians enslaved the Jews. And listen, saints of God, countless other nations have enslaved people of every color, every race, every creed, and still enslave people today. How many of you know sex slavery is a worldwide plague in our world today? It's huge. You don't ever hear much about it on the news, but it's huge. It's still a worldwide plague. Human uh, trafficking and sex slavery is a huge industry. People are making millions and billions of dollars selling human beings for another's pleasure. Oh, listen to And the Bible in no way condones it. So Joseph was forced into slavery. He was sold into slavery against his will. We are slaves. We are servants of Christ by choice. We have wholly surrendered our will to God. So listen, uh, saying sometimes when we are surrendered to God's will, he has to take us a place out of our comfort zone. Sometimes he has to break a relationship or two. 
Sometimes he has to allow storms to blow in, or sometimes we have to get fired from a certain job uh, and get placed in unfamiliar surroundings so that he may show himself strong. A place he has to take us to sometimes where somebody will recognize the calling on our life, where somebody will recognize the anointing of our lives. Sometimes, you know, when we hear that, we sang the song this morning, sometimes when we hear that phrase, a new season, right? We hear a, a new season, we say, oh, a fresh anointing, and people are prophesying over us, and oh, you're going to another level. We begin to think, easy street, let me help somebody here. And your new season won't always be a box of chocolates. Mm. Learn how to uh, discern the difference between the prophetic and the pathetic. Your fresh anointing, honey, sometimes it's going to take some thorns and thistles along with it. That's why we often hear testimonies like, I never planned to be a missionary in Mozambique, but here I am now 20 years later, still with these children over here, and I can't leave. That's why you hear testimonies. I never planned to pastor a church, but here I am 15 years later. I never uh, planned on teaching a woman's group or a, a men's group. I never planned on getting involved with Operation 2535, but I can't leave now. I'm, I'm here. God has placed me here, but here I am. Isn't that just like our God, though? I know you all know this verse. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know. You don't. You won't miss that right there. It's God who knows the plans he has for you. We must learn to submit ourselves wholly and give ourselves over to God Almighty. I know the plans I have for you. God has a plan for our lives, and his plan, listen, in that same scripture, includes favor somebody shall favor god has favorable plans for our life the challenge is that we don't always know where our favor is coming from it took joseph to go into slavery before the favor of god. oh come on somebody now listen there's nothing wrong with having your own plans having your own plans is a good thing it's a godly thing it's a biblical thing you know we always used to say in the sales industry if you fail to plan plan to fail you can't just be like a ship wandering out at sea oh i don't know wherever you know case or raw you have to have plans there's nothing wrong but you allow the uh god of the universe to guide them we 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 have to put our plans before the lord and let him guide us so there's nothing wrong with having plans but listen honey you better have some flexibility with those plans in your spirit because it's a sure thing for God to fulfill that plan in your life. There's going to be some detours, huh? There's going to be some hills and some valleys. How many of you know there's going to be some desert time and some dry time and some lonely time and some thunder and some lightning and some storms and some hurricanes along the way? Come on, church. See, while Joseph was at home, he was comfortable. He had a schedule. He was the manager. He was daddy's favorite. Everything was just sailing along fine. But how many of you know God had bigger plans for Joseph? We must be careful, saints of God, that we don't become too complacent in our walk with Jesus Christ. Don't become too relaxed. Don't become too comfortable. Because how many of you know God will comfort the troubled? But he will also trouble the comfort. Don't get too comfortable, honey. We must remember that Joseph was Potiphar's property. Potiphar purchased him. Joseph didn't have an organized labor union fighting for his work rights and his wages. Joseph didn't have a union fighting for his benefits and his work conditions and his vacation time. He wasn't worried about overtime. Come on, church. Regardless of where you find yourself today. Listen, I'm trying to encourage you. Regardless of where you find yourself, whether you're on a new job or you just got fired from your job, whether you're just about to get married or just about to get divorced, whether you're about to start a business or file bankruptcy, no matter where you are, listen, my friend, God 
can find you and bless everything you put your hands to and cause you to prosper. Why? Because nobody can hide from God. Psalm 139, Caleb. The Bible says this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? I can't flee from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there, God. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there, God. If I rise on the weeks of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me tight. So no matter whether you find yourself in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, or somewhere out in the jungle of Africa, honey, you cannot hide from God's favor. It's like grace and mercy following you everywhere you go. Come on, saint of God. Give our God a praise. No matter what your situation, no matter how jacked up everything is around you, you're not beyond hope. You're not beyond uh, favor. You're not beyond blessing. No matter where you are, whether it's your fault or somebody else's fault, our God is able to find you and prosper you and pour his favor on you right in the middle of your Egyptian slavery. Oh, come on, somebody put their hands together and give our God a praise. Now let me shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about positioning our attitude. Because in this story, we must also remember that Joseph is about 250 to 300 miles away from home. Which in that day, he may as well have been on the other, other side of the earth. It wasn't like he could just call Uber. Amen? It wasn't happening. He wasn't getting a ride home. So he was in a new country, completely different culture, speaking a different language. There was virtually no chance, not a nothing, of him ever going home to be with his family again. This is powerful. Listen to this. In the whole story of Joseph, nowhere do we ever read of Joseph ever complaining about his work conditions, his living conditions. He never gripes about not being able to see his family or grumble or whine about how he arrived in his current dilemma. He never, ever complained, not one time. Pastor, you need to keep on preaching. I'm going to get an amen somewhere in there. Thank you. <laughs> he didn't blame the Republicans. He didn't blame the Democrats. Remember, it was his own brothers. It was their actions that sold him into slavery. This wasn't of his own doing. If anybody had the right to yell, this isn't fair, it was Joseph. Anybody. You never hear, why am I suffering? Why do I have to go through? I thought I was the favored one. Everybody's supposed to bow down to me. The, those were my dreams. I was ruling everyone. Now I'm not living a dream. I'm living a nightmare. See, Joseph didn't know that that was part of the plan. But you never hear that from Joseph ever. Joseph, listen, church. He had positioned himself for God's blessing. He had positioned himself in his attitude for God's favor. I want to help somebody this morning to position yourself for God's favor. How? Here we go. Number one, Joseph positioned himself by first having the right attitude. Secondly, by having holy integrity, which we're going to read about and learn about next message. He never complained. He was able to guard his tongue. And one of the ways you guard your tongue is by guarding your attitude. Listen, <laughs> if you want to show folk how full of the Holy Spirit you are, you don't do it by speaking in tongues. You know, some folks, you know, they show you how Holy Spirit, but then, you know, five minutes later, they're cussing somebody out. See, if you got so much of the Holy Ghost you can speak in tongues, you should have enough Holy Ghost to shut that cussing mouth down. But you know, the, full, the, the church today is full of folk, you know, they want to be, their gifts to be seen. They want to prophesy. They want to... Listen, the Bible says we don't judge the tree by the gift. 
how do we judge a tree? By the fruit. Is there some patience there? Is there some joy there? Is there some long suffering there when you're going, come on, come on, everybody's going to go through. Is there some love there? Is there some humility there? That's how we judge a tree. Not by how well we sing. Not by how well we can preach. Not by our big church. But it's by the fruit of a person that we judge people. So we have to have our attitude correct. If you have a foul attitude, listen, you will have a foul tongue. The Bible's clear to say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So here's some practical advice on keeping a positive attitude. Number one, first of all, be transformed by the renewing of your mind with the Word of God. Romans chapter 1 is clear. Do not be conformed, meaning from outside pressure, like a little cookie cutter. Don't be conformed to the things of this world, but rather be transformed. That word in the Greek, metanoia, means from the inside out. The Holy Spirit is working within you, and it's bringing a change about in your life. It's like a, a, a caterpillar going to the butterfly. You see, that Holy Spirit should be in you, twisting around, convicting you. Come on, church. We change from the inside out. We change by the reading of the word, by the transforming, by the word. Uh, also, Paul writes in Philippians 4, I believe it's uh, verse 8, he says, think on these things, whatever things are lovely and pure and of good report, whatever's praiseworthy. In other words, Paul is saying, train your mind. Come on, remember, when Paul wrote Philippians, he was in a prison. How many of us? would be sitting in a prison cell writing to the church, listen, think on these things, whatever is pure and lovely. Of, no, we'd be griping and complaining because remember, in Paul's prison, he didn't have color TV and a tennis court or ping pong or basketball hoops. He wasn't served three squares a day. He didn't have a weight room that he could go to. If folk didn't bring him food, he would starve to death. That's just the way the prison. But he said, listen, think on these things. So train your mind. Paul said it even this way. He said, I have learned to be content with whatever I have, whether I am wealthy or poor. I have learned. Come on, saints. We need to go to school sometimes and learn to be content where we are. Position ourselves for the blessing of the Holy Ghost. Let the peace of God, because if you read on there with thanksgiving, let the peace of God rule and reign in your heart. That's the favor of God. That's blessing in your life. While all hell is breaking loose, the Holy Spirit brings you that peace in your life. Listen, sometimes God is more interested in changing you than your environment. So many times we want God to change our circumstances, honey, but he wants to change your heart. When he changes your heart, the circumstance really doesn't mean anything anymore. Oh, this is good preaching, y'all. So we got to position ourselves for God's blessing. Remember, saints, it took the Israelites, watch this, 40 years to arrive in the promised land. That journey should have took two weeks. Huh. Here's a question for you. How many Christians are still stuck in the desert when they should have been out of their wilderness and into the promised land a long time ago? But they're still fumbling and bumbling and stumbling around. The number one reason for the Israelites why they stayed in the wilderness because they couldn't stop complaining. Read your Bible. They murmured and murmured and murmured and God said, all right, take another lap around Mount Sinai. See if you learned your lesson. Oh, this manna, I want quail. Take another lap around Mount Sinai. We're thirsty, Moses. We need some water. Here's water out of rock. Don't you see that? They look like giants. They 
they just couldn't stop complaining. Listen, if you, honey, if you're still in your wilderness, if you're still there, shh, I gotta be nice when I, I'm trying to be nice when I say this. Because, because every time I think of this, I think of my mama. She would say, shut your mouth. Stop the zeet in Italian, she would say. Shut your mouth, stop complaining. Think on these things, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is holy. Give our God a praise. Come on, somebody in the house, do it. You know, the Israelites, instead of freedom and God's provision, they desired their slavery and carnality. I'm talking to the church now. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about God's people. Sometimes folks come into the church, they get saved, but they still desire that slavery called sin. They're called carnal Christians. Even though they were out of Egypt, there was a whole lot of Egypt still in them. And because of their carnal desires and their constant complaining, many of them died in the desert. They never reached the promised land. I personally believe today Many Christians are like that, never reaching the level that God had designed for them here on this earth, going to their grave with their sweetest music yet unplayed. God could trust Joseph with his trouble. He could trust Joseph with the in-between time. Uh, that, that's when so many... Uh, saints of God fall. It's in that in-between time. It's the time between the giving of the promise and the time of the fulfillment of the promise. There's an in-between time. It's usually filled with trial and tribulation. Your faith is going to be tried. Uh, your patience will be tested. Uh, ladies, when you're in your weak time and you know, oh, pastor, I was so lonely and oh, Mr. Wright just come walking in and you know, Pastor, he was like Joseph. He was tall, dark, and handsome. I, I mean, I just, and I was at a weak point, and uh, you better just let him keep on walking along. Unless he's full of the Holy Ghost and loves Jesus more than he loves you, honey. Just keep shuffling. Keep shuffling. But he makes me feel so beautiful when he whisper sweet little things in my ear and uh, uh, like I told you before Eve's first problem was talking to a snake you better learn how to see that snake coming along with that double tongue because honey listen a snake can deceive you a snake can lie right to your face and make that apple look real good but i'm trying to help you to tell that snake just to sliver along somebody mm. you want to add hardship to your life go ahead and fellowship with that snake Watch. Consider Abraham and Hagar. Hagar and Ishmael happened during the in-between time. The time between the son of promise and the promise fulfilled. Now look. Thousands of years later, we're talking generational here, somebody. Thousands of years later, Israelites are still dealing with that issue of Isaac and Ishmael. Sometimes our actions are generational. When we go through our in-between time, we must stay focused on what God has for us. The writer of Hebrews says, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith 
Not to think back how good it was hanging out with the guys or the gals at the, at the nightclub. Or not thinking back like how good that hot shot was. Oh, come on, I want to help somebody here this morning. Uh, not how it was like going from one man to another man or from one woman to another woman. And think, oh, they're going to be Mr. Right. They're going to fix my problems. Listen to me. Give it up. Give it up. We've been delivered from Egypt. Don't keep going back there for the leeks and the onions. My question today, church, is can God trust you with your in-between time? If you're a single man or a single woman, can God trust you, listen, to keep yourself holy? Can you keep yourself pure? While you're in preparation for ministry, can you remain blameless and trustworthy and true even when nobody else is looking? See, that's called integrity. When you do the right thing and nobody else is around. While you're going through that depression, can God trust you with staying away from that bottle, staying away from the crack pipe, staying away from that pornographic website? I'm just going to talk plain to y'all here this morning. In your in-between time, can God trust you to stay off Netflix for eight hours a day? Or they even have a word for that nowadays. They call it binging or something. Where you watch TV for like a whole weekend long. How brain dead must you be to watch? Oops, sorry. I, st I still love you. This, this is just your daddy speaking to you all. <laughs> I'm talking about positioning ourselves, church, for God's outpouring and living our life in hot pursuit of God. How many of you know, listen, it's our Father's desire to bless us. It's his desire to favor us like Joseph. The Bible says exceedingly abundantly of all we could ask or think so we need to position ourselves not by living a life of debauchery and adultery and carousing and then wondering why our life is continuously in turmoil this morning if you're here and your attitude isn't right listen maybe you've made some bad choices maybe you've slipped and fell along the way a uh, two or three or ten or a hundred times today you need to thank God because of his grace. Because there is a remedy in the word as well. It's called, listen, repentance. There's hope. First John in 1 and 9 says, if, somebody shout if. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins. That's our God. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, show you favor. I don't want to harm you. I don't want to beat you up. I want to give you a hope and a future. So listen, Judah, no matter what situation you find yourself in today, there's always hope in God's word. Amen? Amen. You see, when God gives us a dream or a vision, he drops a desire in our heart a true prophetic word, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have to go through some things to get there. God's fire is to purify us, not destroy us. Let me give you the ultimate example in your Bible. Our Father's plan, our God's plan, from the beginning of the foundation of the earth, was for Jesus Christ to be the Savior of the world to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But Jesus had to go through Calvary to get there. So I say this to you this morning. No matter how you ended up, listen, no matter how you ended up in your current situation, no matter who wronged you, if it was a friend or a family member or a father or an uncle, do you all hear what I'm saying this morning? No matter who wronged you, no matter who sold you down the river, even if it were your own brothers or sisters or your mother or your father, even if it was the church itself, even if it was your own pure choices, watch this remedy in the Word of God, Romans chapter 8, 
verses 28 through 39. For we know, somebody say we know, that all things, huh? God works for the good for those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, that he might be the first born among many brothers and sisters and those who he predestined he also called and those he also called he also justified those he justified oh come on somebody he glorified what then shall we say in response to these things if god be for us who can possibly be against us he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him graciously give us judah all things who will bring any charge against those whom god has chosen it is god who justifies who then is the one who condemns somebody shout no one no one Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us oh watch this now who shall separate us from the love of Christ huh shall trouble hardship persecution famine nakedness or danger or sword no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced uh, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody in the house of Judah needs to give him 15 seconds of praise. Oh, come on, saints of God. My God. That is written to you, saint of God. That is your promise. That is your favor from God Almighty through Christ Jesus. And no devil in hell can do anything to you. My God. Let me put a bow on this thing this morning. So whatever your situation is, stop complaining. Stop it. It will not change anything for your benefit. Nowhere in the Bible will complaining change a circumstance for your good. Nowhere. It will always cause you to stay longer in your dilemma. It will always prolong your time in the des desert. It will always extend your time of trying. However, having an attitude of gratitude, thanking God in all things, not for all things, in all things, it will begin to change everything around you. Everything around you for your good. Last scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Watch now. Verse 16 says, rejoice how often? Pray, how always? how always? Continually give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We don't thank God because of a dilemma, but in the middle of our dilemma, we thank God. If you've got a bad doctor's report, you don't thank God, oh, I thank you for, no. But in the midst of that battle, I'm, Lord, I'm going to build an altar of praise right here. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. But test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. 
May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. So have a grateful heart. Fix your mind on the things that are praiseworthy, righteous, pure, and holy, and the things that are admirable, and God of peace will be ushered in to your heart. Saints, we need to learn how to praise him in tough times. Even Paul, once again, said he had to learn how to be content. Paul wasn't always content. We're not always content. But we could learn. Worship him when you're completely surrounded by your enemy. Praise him when you're surrounded by your enemy. And he will turn your night into day. He will sh turn a sure defeat into victory. He will turn your heart of stone into a heart of clay. He will turn your mourning into dancing. He will open the prison doors. Your hardship is just an opportunity for God to show up and show up. Show out. So if you're like Paul and Silas in what seems to be a hopeless situation in prison, you just need to begin to throw up your arms and say, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to worship right here. Come on, somebody in the house, give our God a praise. to proclaim the God.